Hi, this is Marcy Hill, and welcome to What Matters to Miss Marcy, a conversation, a dis diversity discussion with Mitch Mitchell. And I wanted to with Mitch because he is a leadership and diversity expert. So I would like to begin with an introduction. Mitch, could you introduce yourself, please? I can't remember what this means. Oh my goodness. And my Spock thing, it just left me. Anyway, my name is Mitch Mitchell. I do talk about leadership and diversity. I like to say an authority rather than an expert because it's hard to be an expert at something when you can't get everybody to do it. But I, <laughs> so I try. Uh, but I'm also in healthcare finance, just to throw that out there. And I've been writing about it for almost 13 years now. My blog will be 13 in February. Congratulations. Thanks. And I've got two books on the subject. So at least on the topic of leadership, none on diversity, maybe one of these days. But do you discuss diversity in, under the, um, in your leadership books? I, yes, I did. I always think that you need to touch upon diversity, especially if you're, if you're a person of color. Because if you don't touch upon it, then it makes it look like you're trying to avoid the subject and you can't fix anything if you're looking to avoid it. And speaking of being a person of color, I mean, which is obvious here, but I wanted to address an issue that really bugged me. And I'm, yeah, I'll begin. I'm a member of a committee that's led by a seasoned white female so she's over 60 for planning an event and all of the presenters she she was suggesting was white were white they're about to i mean i was about to pop because no one she mentioned now wait, let me step back first of all we're in chicago which is a melting pot of diversity of everything they then we probably have people here that have classifications that we've never thought of. She, she said, "Oh, sure, you know, we'll we'll consider it. Just send me names." Well, I sent her names. Allegedly, she couldn't get in touch with them. A fellow, another member, sent a listing of Hispanic speakers. Contacted. Well, I'm not certain, but that's what she said, and. The event is nearing, is approaching one black presenter. And I don't know who referred the gentleman, but out of 16 speakers, six months of planning, there's only one black speaker. And he's speaking during dinner which is optional. Everybody's not buying dinner. <laughs> so I still think that he's still, he's still getting the short end of the stick. And that had me to, that I, okay, another thing. So we met to plan the, the agenda for the event. And when she was speaking, she said, oh, well, this person was referred by this person. I don't know how she, he or she speaks but it was a referral and that got me to thinking about the work if you have in the work that's like this person and this is just a committee of a small group of people so if you have a leader in a workplace that's not open to diversity is how is it really possible to make progress and that's one question but before you answer that one can you give me a definition of diversity? Because every time I go to different sources, they say one thing, and then when you look at companies, they tend to mean something different. So what is the definition of diversity? And could you address that person I just mentioned? Well, the overall definition of diversity, I hate to say it like this, but it depends on what you're talking about. For us, for instance, diversity basically says that you want everybody to have a fair opportunity to participate and have a, a possibility to achieve something. 
And really, that's all anyone can ask for. It doesn't mean equality. I mean, you know, you're looking for fairness. And fairness basically says that you open it up for everybody. Everyone has the same opportunity. You might have to adjust certain things because people learn at different levels. People had different levels of education. Um, doesn't mean that going to community college might not have given you the same kind of education as going to Harvard, but you know, there are different types of things that could be involved in that. So it basically says that you don't look at anyone's skin color, you don't look at their sex, you don't look at their age, you don't look at their politics, you don't look at their religion, you don't look at any of that. When you're talking about the job force, you're basically saying that whoever comes in the door, you evaluate them based on what they are and you give them the opportunity or not. And hopefully, most of the time, you're going to be fair and give everyone the opportunity because um, one of the things that used to hold people back, you know, we just tell it like it is. When affirmative action first came out, companies said, okay, great, now we have to go find someone. So they would take basically someone who they knew wasn't qualified for the position, bring them in, try to teach them something that they weren't qualified to do because they didn't have any background in it. Then they'd have to let them go and say, see, every one of these we bring in, they can't do the job, and <laughs> we try. Well, that's not really fair, because there's a lot of people who are qualified for those positions who are minority or women or whatever, but they don't want to bring those people in. They wanted to bring in these other people so they could say they at least tried, because that's what the regulations were. And what you started to find out over time is that when you did bring in someone who was, we'll just say, different from what was considered the norm, and they did achieve something, they brought good things into the mix because now you had someone who wasn't thinking like everybody else, who didn't do everything exactly like everybody else, and it always improves the culture of a business when you can have, okay, a diversity of thought. Not diversity of people as much as diversity of thought, but what's the best way to have diversity of thought is by having diversity of people. I mean, you'd have never come up with a lot of the automatic phone messages or different types of things like that if they hadn't brought in disabled people, people who had trouble hearing or people who couldn't speak as well. Uh, there would have never been any reason to have anything without those people coming along. So that's okay, how you get to think of these types of things. Okay. okay. And, and that's, I, I agree, but I have another question. Do you think diversity is just thrown, is a word that's thrown around today because um, people or companies are shining a light or well, organizations are shining, shining a light on the fact that they're, that companies are not as diverse as they should be? Because I, I think when I was in college, college 100 years ago, they had introduced diversity. As a matter of fact, they did, because I went to a diversity workshop in Illinois University in the 90s, and I was the only black person in that class. But I do realize that <coughs> just color, because you, and once we started introducing ourselves, you had people from small town USA, some were from Illinois, some were not. So, of course, they'll have different experiences than the people from our Chicago. They have, of course, you have the income levels and different levels of schooling. But that was my first introduction to intro <laughs> well, to diversity, which was not very diverse in color, but it was diverse in other ways. So today, when you look at companies that use diversity yeah do you think it's just a cold word or do you think they're actually practicing or attempting to diversify their workforce uh i think a lot of companies are just basically giving it lip service because it's the word of the day and i hate thinking that but the proof is the proof you know back in the 80s xerox was a company that actually embraced diversity I know that because my dad worked at, at Xerox. And Xerox was one of the first companies to hire a diversity uh, uh, 
I'm going to say educator, but that's not really a diversity trainer. You know, this is what Xerox did. And Xerox is all over the world. And so they brought uh, different people in and they scheduled their own types of training. And that worked out well at the time. Um, and it wasn't a mandatory thing as far as the federal government. It, it should have been because if you have a federal contract, you're supposed to at least enforce some kind of rules of diversity. But Xerox went above and beyond. And that worked out well for Xerox at the time. Now, of course, Xerox has had other issues, but diversity has always still been a primary thing for them. Uh, you don't see that with almost any other company. As much as Google these days is talking about having a diversity officer, you can tell that they've been failing at how it works. Um, uh, Facebook has failed at how it works. Uh, Silicon Valley totally has failed how it works. Banking has failed. It's it's just endemic. That's just kind of how it is. You look at the Fortune 500 companies and you still, I don't think, have five people of color who are CEOs of <laughs> Fortune 500. And, you know, let's throw in uh, Asians aren't in a lot of those positions. And this is a group who traditionally a lot of folks say, well, they're pretty high on the education level, but it's certainly not reflecting them getting those positions. I haven't seen any, uh, a whole lot of Changs or uh, Yashimoto's or any Indian name. You know, in other words, you, you can give a lot of lip service to these types of things, but it's just not happening. And it's not uh, reflected from the top. And that's where you normally, well, that's where you would think it would, that that you think it will be adopted there first and then have a top down effect. But since you're not seeing it, it's, it's safe to say that it's not really being practiced. Yeah. I mean, it's safe to say that there. You can always look at the pay disparities, you know, uh, disparity between men and women. Uh, I was with an organization called Arise for 13 years on the board. And, you know, it worked with disabled people trying to live, you know, regular lives with everyone else. But it's hard for a lot of those people to get jobs where they have the intellect to be able to do anything that anyone else can do. But sometimes they may need a little bit of technology to help them out. Well, you know, it's still there. Get the technology, help those people get in there but they don't want to worry about some of these other things so they can just kind of overlook it and say well we don't have any applicants which probably is true they probably got something in the mail and they read a couple of things and say yeah, i don't think i'm going to go this direction you know it's hard to to pin someone down as far as saying well you've got this lack of diversity when you're disabled and you don't have anything specific on there, but you have some things on there that might lead someone to say, I don't think this is anything I want to deal with. How do you, you know, what do you do? What do you say? You know, uh, it's different than getting a resume that says Rahim on it. And you're saying, okay, I don't want that. And then you can come back and say, well, wait, we know you got this letter from Rahim. We helped send it out. <laughs> you know, that's an easier bit of thing where you can say, okay, we know that you're not showing diversity because we did this thing. We can see all these other names here as opposed to the other, you know. Yeah, so that was um, the situation that really burned me. And then for me personally, when I, okay, as a black female, when I look at diversity, I always look first at black and then <coughs> the female population. And a lot of places I don't, I won't say a lot of places. Let me, okay, I'm, just, I'm switching gears here. I go downtown a lot and downtown Chicago. And after a certain street, I promise you, Mitch, the, and this is just from observation. This is not statistical. Whenever I, there's a certain street and west of that street, you see very few black people. And I'm, you know, a lot of times I'm probably the only one walking down the street and it's not, you know, and I go on different days, I go at different times and I'm looking like, dude, where are the black people? 
And then there was an article in Crane Chicago Business. This was years ago. And, and I read something recently too, but it said as far as close as black people live downtown, live as close to black people live downtown Chicago, there are not a lot of black people working downtown Chicago, which is disheartening to me because I'm looking for a job downtown because it's close to home. I'm not willing to travel because I won't say I'm not willing to travel, but that commute is disturbing because if you look at people's commutes, hours to work downtown. So if the money weren't downtown, people would not be coming to Chicago for it. So that's another reason why I'm like, I'm going downtown. Mm -hmm. But everybody that's coming in though, okay, I'll say at least 90% of people I've seen come in from all of those Northern suburbs are not black. And that's, I mean, that I don't, I wish I could work with like the University of Chicago or some other school to, because I'm sure Crane's got their statistics from somewhere, but I would love to prove myself correct based on what I see with you the know, help of somebody who wants to do a study. Yeah, but I'm going I'm to tell you the truth. There are a lot of studies that have shown that there's a lack of diversity in a lot of places. And you know what changes? Almost nothing. Because, wow. well, there, there's no consequences toward it. The only consequence there seems to be is that something gets shown in a newspaper. And for a week, maybe a company is hesitant and doing whatever and they're saying, we're gonna change this, we're gonna change that, whatever. Then the news goes away and everything falls right back to where it was. There's, there's no impetus to do better. And a reality is that if there are any people that have any kind of authority whatsoever, people of color or women or disabled or whomever that are in those companies, it is upon those people to say something and try to make changes. I'll give you an example. Um, I did this twice, but one time, I didn't have enough authority to get anything changed. And later on, I did. Where I was working in healthcare in hospitals. And the first time, <clears throat> I was the first minority director that the hospital had ever had. And there were no other minorities actually working there at the time in the entire wow. hospital. And it was a big hospital. And it wasn't a large minority population in town, but it was a military base there. So there should have been at least enough people to come in and do work, but there weren't. And so I went to the HR director and I said, hey, there should be more minorities in this hospital. Even if it's not black people, it should be some Hispanic people here because we have a population of people who come here. You know, New York State has a lot of migrant workers. People don't know that, but New York State has a lot of migrant workers for the apples and other uh, farm items. <laughs> we have produce. And we didn't have anyone in the hospital who could speak any of those languages. And the guy said, wow. well, it's not really my job to have to go out and recruit people for that, to which I said, well, in my opinion, it is. Now, I got away with saying that because I brought a lot of money into the place. But in essence, this is a guy who basically said, OK, you know what? I'm not doing it. He had no interest in doing it. And I didn't live in the area. There were no other minorities working there. At one point, another minor, minority director actually did come in, the wrong guy. I hate to say that, but he was the wrong guy. Uh, and, you know, eventually we were gone. Many years later, I'm at a different hospital director once again. However, this hospital had minorities working there. Housekeeping, cafeteria. <laughs> wow. But it had black people there. Uh, it, it just as a quick, funny story, my first two weeks at that hospital, people in town were coming into the hospital to look at me. Wow. Wait. 
how, how large was the town and how large was the hospital? It was a 58 bed hospital. So it wasn't very big. The town, maybe three to 5,000. But the funny thing is, it wasn't just white people who came into the hospital to look at me. You know, you, you know, think about it. People don't want to go to the hospital. Nobody willingly wants to come to the hospital. And these were people coming to the hospital, not for any medical work whatsoever. They came in. Uh, my office faced the front of the hospital. It was open glass. You know, everyone else was kind of hidden, but this is where my office was. And so people were coming in and they would just be doing this like they had heard the story. Or I'd be walking down the hall and people would just come in and then they would stop. And they would just watch me walking by. <laughs> it was so weird. How did that make you feel? Oddly enough, because of my background, I knew what it was and it didn't bother me. And it didn't overly shock me after the first day. I've, I've had some interesting things that have happened in my life uh, that a lot of other people haven't. So having this happen, like I said, I was kind of prepared. It shocked other people, but it didn't shock me. So anyway, later on, I'm now at this other hospital. Once again, I've helped turn parts of it around financially. We're doing really well. I go to the HR director and I said, look, we need to have more minorities working here. Oh, we do. No, I'm sorry. Having people in housekeeping and cafeteria are not enough. We don't have anyone working in this hospital who speaks Spanish. We don't have anyone besides me who is showing that they can come into this hospital, work, have an opportunity to be like everyone else and do all this other kind of stuff. And he said, well, I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to do about that. Because this time he didn't live in that town either. I said, okay, if I get people to come in here and put in applications, will you at least help me to make sure that they get opportunities to get interviews for different types of positions. Nice. And he says, sure, if you think you can. Well, one of the things I like to talk about with leadership is that good leaders will talk to anybody. Doesn't matter what position that they have, doesn't matter what they do, they can talk to anybody. That's what I did. I went and I talked to a group of these people who worked in housekeeping, and who worked in the cafeteria because I'd always talked to them. And matter of fact, I had had the conversation with them and I said, how come no black people are ever applying for any positions? This is what they're telling me. And they said, well, because the hospital's never hired any. I said, I'm here. So yeah, but you're not from here, which I wasn't. I lived an hour away. So I said, okay, y'all need to go out in the community. You need to go talk to some black people. You need to talk to some of the Hispanic people. You need to talk to some of those Haitians because like, they speak French. I said, you need to talk to some of these people who have stayed in this town and tell them, go to the hospital and pull out an application and fill out an application. I said, I can't guarantee what the positions are going to be, but they're telling me they're not getting anybody. Tell people to go to the hospital, fill out the application. Tell them I said it. And next thing you know, they started getting all these applications from people. Nice. And within... I think three or four months, okay, my department ended up hiring the first minority who was not in cafeteria, who was not in housekeeping, and I didn't do it. I just hired someone, but that got someone in the door. Then someone else came, and nice. then they hired someone who actually spoke Spanish because it was, a like I said, you have a lot of uh, migrant farmers who come and pick all these crops. And then every year there's a whole group that stay. And so the hospital was always having to contact someone in Rochester to do interpretation over the phone because they didn't have any of that. So it started to change the culture a little bit because now there were minorities. Then the hospital hired someone who happened to be deaf, but she was a lab tech. Now yeah. you had someone who they could reach out to during the day or even sometimes in the evening if she worked the evening shift, if they needed someone to go down and do signing for them, something that they never had before. It just changes the culture when you get different people in. And this was, you know, way up Northern New York, right on Lake Ontario. 
um, where a lot of people wouldn't have ever thought there was any type of population to do that with whatsoever. But it helped to change the culture because once people saw that the hospital would hire, apply for that. And there were positions. There's positions in a hospital. You have ward clerks, for instance. Uh, you have secretarial positions. You will have a runner. Uh, you know, someone to push the bodies different places or whatever. Um, and all it takes is a little bit of representation for other people to see it. I wasn't enough. I was always kind of considered the anomaly. You know, he's from Syracuse. He's not from here. Right, right. He's coming in for this specific purpose. Uh, he knows this other kind of thing, but I wasn't, quote unquote, of the people. But once the of the people started coming in, then that's how things started to change. So it has to come from inside. And I have another question for you. For you. Oh, authority. People in authority um, in this position to have a question. When I go places, <coughs> why do you always see black people or women in, um, in diversity? Positions when you're at job fairs um, to recruit people. Legitimate, well, you think they're just there as children for diversity working at positions? Or do you think that they, I don't know, wait a minute, scratch that thought, scratch it. Yeah, so I guess the point is, why do you, do you see black people and women, and no, not just black teens and women in those positions? <laughs> uh, I pay attention to those details. Maybe I might just, because of my issue with no, the whole okay. diversity thing. It's a it's a it's an interesting observation. It's a fairly true observation, and you have to think of it like this: if you say that you're going to open things up and you want to be more diverse, can you show that you're being more diverse and opening up diversity if you put a white male in the position of diversity officer? Yeah, that would be counterintuitive, counterproductive. Yeah, I, and I'm not saying that they may not be qualified, but sometimes you need to have the image of what you're looking to change. And let's face the fact here. If you have a minority woman in the position of the diversity officer, You've killed two stones with uh, two you know, problems with one shot. It, it, should it necessarily be that way? No, but really that's kind of how it is. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's one of those weird conundrums where you're saying, well, you know, if you're looking to try to prove that you can have equality and have you know, fairness across the board, then how come I can't put a white person in there? But you know that one as well as, you know, that problem as well as I do, that every single minority is going to have a connection. Like, what? What? We can't even have that. You know, it's just how it's going to be. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's like the NBA now. Let's, let's, let's look at the NBA. Anytime there's a good white player, people are like, how'd that happen? And... You know, he can't be that good or he's got to just be an outside shooter. He can't be he's an <laughs> outside shooter. Or he's a big guy in the middle who can rebound. And people dismiss that there are a lot of white, talented players. Europeans are definitely, you know, you know, have a ton of black Europeans showing up over here, although there are some. Uh, it proves that talent should be talent, but folks see things totally different. And it takes some time to break down barriers. It's like you can look at the NFL now and you see there's a bunch of black quarterbacks. But back in the day, 
you know, when James Gilliam played, you know, for the Pittsburgh Steelers uh, some games, and everyone like, wait, a black quarterback replaced Terry Bradshaw? How that? What? He can't do any of that. You know, <laughs> times times definitely changed. Um, so that now black quarterback can be seen. I'm still waiting for the day where there's a black kicker. I don't think we've had one yet. Well, you lost me with the, the football analogy, but I understand. <laughs> <laughs> and I, had, um, I only have a couple more. I think probably one more question. Actually, you didn't let me answer the first thing you talked about. Oh, well, oh, with the scenario, if you yeah. have the people in those positions, how can we really expect change? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, let's come back to that. We had the same thing that happened here in Syracuse a few years ago <clears throat> where they were putting together this concert series. Uh, and so I was I had someone reach out to me who knew me, knew that I did diversity because every act that the committee put together was white. I mean, no one else, no black acts, no Hispanic, act, nothing. As a matter of fact, only one woman act. Yeah. Well, you know, she she wanted to talk to me about it. And so I said, well, what was the committee makeup? She says, well, supposedly it was like four white men. I said, OK, so let's think about this. So you had four white men and it turned out that two of them were young and two of them were older. <clears throat> so I said, so who are they going to bring that they know? Uh, they probably don't really know a lot of folks outside. They have to come to a consensus. So they brought in people who they knew. That's who they booked. Um, yes, there's probably a lot of good young women out there who might come in who can perform at the amphitheater because we have an amphitheater who, you know, as opposed to the big theater. So, you know, you're looking at the size. Of, of group that you're looking to have to come in to do that, whatever. I said, you know, if you have a committee where there's no one that knows any of these other acts, what do you expect? And if you have a committee where one person probably has way more authority than everyone else, and that person doesn't have a lot of knowledge about things outside of their one particular area and really isn't interested in finding out more about that, then you're going to have the same issue. It's like you've seen, okay, you've seen one of my blogs, right? Every once in a while I have these articles about top 10 or top 20 black social media influencers or black bloggers because no one else will write that because people always put together these lists of all these marketers and whatever, and there's never any black people on it never. except for Eileen. Every once in a while, every once in a while we get Eileen, but in general, right. <laughs> Anybody else. And you go and you question those people. Well, I don't know any of those people. Or, well, no, this is my list. And I think these people, oh, really? Well, let me name so and so here and name so and so here. And what about so and so here? Well, I don't know any of those people. You should. That's why I put mine out. Now, here's part two of that. I put that out and then I let those people know hey, look, I mean, I've mentioned you on here. Try to help to put this out there to, so that we get more people to know who these folks are. You know what? You find out a lot of those people don't care. They don't care. They're thinking about their own, their own game. And, you know, I can only do so much. I, I, you know, I can put it out there, but if you're not there to help, then there's nothing you can do about it. It's kind of like these interviews. I mean, we're going to do this interview. You know, I'm going to put this out there. I'm going to come back to it every, you know, three, four months, whatever, I'm gonna put it out there again. But a lot of folks who you've interviewed, I don't know if if a lot of them have put it back out there to show. I mean, that's really what it, yeah, what, no. yeah. You know, that's what it comes down to is that you have to be willing to help promote yourself, help promote others. If someone does this, it already kind of puts something together for you, you're not losing anything by putting it out there you're on a list i try to go back and i try to help and do these things but if people aren't interested in helping themselves there's really not a lot you can do except sit back later on and say gee no one ever even considers me when a list comes out well did you work on promoting yourself out there to put it out there did you you know do all this other kind of stuff you know and i'm, not, and I'm glad you mentioned diversity 
online because I know I look at I look at those lists too. And when if there's a list, you no, know, if the list is written written by somebody black, on that list mostly is black. If it's written by somebody white, everybody on that list is white. There are no there's a lack of diversity. And when I wrote my book, 62 Blog Posts to Overcome Bloggers Block, the goal was to diversify the blog owners. Mostly because as a blogger, you, so I, I, you know, we know that there's a community of bloggers of all types. It's not just black and white. You have, you have daddy bloggers, Hispanic bloggers, food bloggers. So you have communities. However, people tend to be left out. And I tried to reach out to people just because of race, because of what they did. I had some writers in the book. Well, I had some writers. So I didn't even know because, first of all, I needed help. <laughs> but then a lot of people said yes. But there were some blogs like this one guy, and I don't know if his blog is still, still up and running. Um, he had a site called Crunchy Crunchy Biscuit. I needed a human blog. And when I did it, his came up. But I mean, he did help promote in the early stages, but that was one of those things where, well, at that point, well, I was, I didn't really care. I almost had, I was looking for human ADS. Yes. We, you know, we connected. And, you know, that the point of not only bring together bloggers, but diversifying the content of my book and I forgot what my original point was <laughs> however I think I, I was talking about the lack of diversity online also because of because as a blogger I see different things and you know and like you said you created the list of black bloggers but yeah, yeah. it's that's just a an issue for me and then now the list that you're referring to are longer you'll see like a hundred people on a list see, when i don't see black people i also go to female they're adding more women but they're always the same people <coughs> yeah which shows and i mean that's not even to say they know the people they just know their name they reach out to the folks and they say yes i think i'm kind of over that part too i'll just start interviewing every well probably be black initially mostly because that's who i know yeah and i understand how the diversity thing works but then even on with social media social media has opened doors and allowed you to create opportunities with people and connect with people you probably you know you never would have connected with before mm -hmm. but it's just yeah that's just a point of um contention with me the lack of diversity you know, people, and then even when you read, it's the same thought. That's why I try to, with my blog post, I try to post because one day I was doing, a, I'll, I'll just say a search on how to start a blog. Everybody said the same thing. And nobody really helps you really start a blog because the point, from, well, in my opinion, the point for starting a blog is doing an assessment of who you're talking to, you know, doing assessment. Where everybody start with, oh, you start with WordPress. So yeah, you don't even have a diversity of thoughts, especially online nowadays, which have millions of people reading and writing, but still no diversity. See, you, 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 well, you basically covered my topic on my blog where I say, you know, folks are always saying exact same. You know, here's the thing. There's nothing wrong with the majority. Let's go that route instead, that say, get wordpress software and set up there's nothing wrong with that there are different ways that you can communicate that though for instance a lot of people will start with that one when i wrote my series of better blogging way back when i said you could look at either going self-hosting or using a free platform. I would suggest if you're not used to writing, this is just me talking off the cuff because I don't remember exact words I said, but I said if you're looking to do something and you want to see if you can write, I suggest you start with something free and write 10 articles.
to see if you can write 10 articles. Because if you can't write 10 articles, then you probably shouldn't start blogging in the first place because you're going to need to write a lot over a long period of time. Now, no one else has ever said that as far as I know, because I keep looking to see if anyone else has ever said that. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I've talked to different people, they say, ooh, write 10 articles first. Wow, I had never thought about that. Thank you, that's mine. So, it, but still, I mentioned WordPress, I mentioned Joomla and Drupal. I don't know how to use any of that stuff except for WordPress. But I also had, you know, you start with that early stuff. But I still came back to it because it is still a major reality. The majority of blogs are, uh, they're self-hosted or using WordPress software. So there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with talking about niche blogging because Yes, that's a way to go. But I took our niche blogging and I went a totally different direction with it. You know, you've, you've seen my stuff. You see how right. I write. I may take a subject that everyone else has talked about, but then I'll add stuff to it because that's my bit of diversity. I don't want to say the same thing everyone else says. And every once in a while, someone has written something that looks like a direct copy from somewhere else and i see it but they've given it a title that you're thinking oh this is going to be something different and then it's not it's the same and thing then it hurts the heck out of me and then i write about it and i castigate them in a post I, look here here's another one of these people don't do this let me beat this up for you <laughs> you, know, you, you, I, you sometimes you just got to do that you, you just get so irked um but I will say this, there are definitely a lot of black bloggers out there. There's a lot of Hispanic bloggers out there. There's a lot of, definitely a lot of women. There's a lot of everybody. There's a lot of disabled. There's a lot of everybody. Thing is that there are these pockets of people who have found their community and they support that community and then they help to promote that community. We as black people don't do that so well. We don't publicize each other all that well and promote each other all that well. It doesn't happen. Even if they're you know, working together, it, it doesn't happen. Um, women in general don't do that. In general, work at home moms do. Work at home moms promote each other immensely and they buy from each other. <laughs> And it's a big industry. So that group has it. Uh, Asians in this country don't do it. In India, they do it really well. In Japan, they do it really well. But then that's their country. Right. But here, they don't do it so well. But a lot of times, they don't have to. Because... You get someone like a Neil Patel who puts together these monstrous posts that are really beautiful that I was going to try to compete with for a while. And then I had to write a post saying, you know what? I can't be Neil Patel. I cannot write five to 10,000 word articles every single week. <laughs> I'm just going nuts. So I gave that up. But you will find people who will promote them because of that kind of thing. That's what you need. We need a Neil deGrasse Tyson of blogging. We need a Neil deGrasse Tyson of leadership, which I've been trying to be for all these years. And I'm trying to bring other people along, but the majority of people kind of don't want to come along. And the folks who I'm trying to reach, which is, you know, you try to reach everyone, but even when you try to reach the niche thing, you know, we don't get a lot. I have to thank you because you help promote me a lot. I appreciate that. You and Bev Mahone. Oh, I appreciate you. You're, you're in support too. Yeah, I mean, we gotta love Bev too. You know, throw Bev some, She's some love. Amazing. Yes, she is. I'm in two of her books. Believe it or not. Did you read her last one about the millennials? Oh, of course I did. Oh, you knew she had to make sure I read that. I, well, I, um, I have my copy, but. And I've read it, but I've been a slacker. Having done the book with you, I guess I can do it now. Now that I'm more into my video, attempting to be anyway. There you go. <laughs> to wrap up, Mitch, but I have two questions for you. Okay. <clears throat> the first one, who is Neil deGrasse? 
That's the first one. Neil deGrasse Tyson, astrophysicist. He is the director of the Hayden Planetarium in New York City. He is pretty much recognized, believe it or not, as the smartest man in the world, which used to go to Stephen Hawking. Right. Oh, okay. But Neil deGrasse Tyson knows everything about everything. Nice. He's a black man, New York City, uh, like I said, astrophysicist, gourmet cook, he was a wrestler, so he does athletic stuff too. He, 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 go look him up. Look up a couple of his videos. The man is fast, so funny. He's he just anything. I'm serious. Neil deGrasse Tyson. Neil deGrasse Tyson is the guy who you would look to and say, wait, if this guy who was born in Brooklyn can end up being this kind of intelligent, as a black man in Brooklyn, when the schools were not considered all that good, this should be an indication that anyone can do it. But no, once again, he has hit a stratosphere that other people just say, okay, you know what? No, he's just this. He don't count. And he should. That's the second one. Second question. Where can we find you online? And if, when, um, and if people want to hire you for their, uh, to keynote their events on leadership, diversity, and which other and let us know which other topic that you speak about. How can we find you for all of that information? Okay, let's start with this because I did an interview at the beginning of the month on leadership, and the guy later on said I was trying to get you to tell what your Twitter handle is. My Twitter handle is Mitch underscore M. So that's me on Twitter. My website, ttmitchellconsulting.com. That's a good starting place because that will tell you a lot about what I do for my main business. So obviously it's uh, leadership and diversity, uh, motivation, but it's also healthcare finance um, because my basic job, the one that pays me the most money is going in and helping hospitals increase revenue and increase cash. That's just something I have to be really good at. Um, my most prominent blog is called imjustsharing.com where I talk about blogging, writing, social media, and sometimes almost anything else that I want to talk about. I've spoken in nine states on all these topics. So um, I'm looking to travel more and do more talking and get paid for it. I ain't just coming to talk. You know, I don't want you to just put me up in a hotel and give me some free hors d'oeuvres. I don't even know how you say that name. Hors d'oeuvres. There you go. I don't want just free hors d'oeuvres or whatever. Even if you buy me a pack of those new Oreos with the cinnamon stuff in it, which turned out to be really, really good, by the way. But even if it, that is not, I want to get paid something for it. But, you know, you can do that. I've got two YouTube channels. You can find me online. As a matter of fact, one, just put in Mitch Mitchell. and if you come across the black guy, that's me, because the other one is going to be Jimi Hendrix, former drummer. Or go ahead and put in T.T. Mitchell Consulting, and that will get you my business YouTube channel. And, and that's yeah. a good start, because I've got over 5,000 articles online. I, you know, I shouldn't be that hard to miss. Well, thank you for your time and um, taking time to discuss this topic with you, Mitch. It, it has been a joy. Thank you. And I will catch you on Twitter. Okay. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.